نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and we bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. He has no partners and no rivals. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mention and grant him peace and send his blessings and his salutations upon him and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the day of recompense. All you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and fear Him the way He deserves to be feared and do not die except in the state of submission as Muslims. Brothers in faith, what you are about to hear is probably something you have heard before. And the issue is not in redundance. The issue is in not, it's not in repetition. The issue is in the comprehension and implementation. It is no secret to each and every one of you, including myself, that we are constantly reminded of what we know. That's why it's called a reminder, because we already know. However, we fail in execution. We fail in taking heed. We fail in converting that into action and therefore we need to be reminded again and again and as many times as necessary until one of two things happen either we take heed and make a change or we die once we die then the reminder will be of no benefit you cannot make those in the grave hear you and while this ayah has vast amount of meanings, one of which is that the fact that the scholars use this to prove that there is no communication between the living and the dead upon visiting the gravesite. Which is something that the people that like to associate partners with Allah, whether intentionally or unintentionally, like to do. They go to these graves, and they sit there waiting for inspiration and communication and they see, leave notes and send messages to the dead man who is supposedly away from the awliya of Allah who is going to facilitate their relationship with Allah. Classic shirk. Pure Qurayshi shirk. But with different names, different concepts, different characters. It's the same of Lat and Uzza. The same thing that the Mushrikeen of Quraysh were saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was calling them to the worship of Allah alone. قَالُوا مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَا إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى We don't worship them except so that they can get us closer to Allah. And what they mean by worship meaning dua. We are seeking intercession, al-wasila, through those people. وَقَالُوا هَؤُلَاءِ شُفَعَاؤُنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ They said these are only our intercessors with Allah. We know, we know Allah is one. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask the disbelievers who created the heavens and the earth, they will say Allah. Of course that was ancient disbelievers. Modern disbelievers, they will tell you God what? God who? Oh no, no, no. This is a... Uh, we don't really have a good explanation, but it's not God. That's really the summary of a discussion with the you know, most intellectual atheist or agnostic person you will meet today. 
no matter how smart they are, they remain to be the dumbest creature Allah created. By all means, the cattle and the livestock are more intelligent than those human beings by Allah, I swear. Allah said in the Quran, they are like the cattle? No, they are more astray. Because the cow knows Allah. And this disbeliever is in a state of perpetual confusion about who created the heavens and the earth. I don't see anything. I don't see anything. Where is God? Where is your brain that you haven't seen either? Don't give me a picture of your brain. I'm talking about the thought process. The fact that you're thinking, irrespective of what organ you have that allows you to think, you have never seen that. But you believe in it. I don't want to go off the topic. The bottom line is the fact that we, on a yearly basis, have to be reminded of what we already know. Either we will take heed now, or we will wait until it's too late, and when it's too late, it's too late. So let me remind myself and you about some fundamental, basic concepts of Islam. Two in particular relevant to this time. The first of which is that this religion has been perfected by Allah already. And that perfection happened on the day of Arafah, during the Hajj of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the only Hajj that he made. On the day of Arafah, Allah revealed the famous ayah that the Jews and the Christians envy us. They envy us because of this ayah, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum. This day, I have perfected, completed your religion for you. They don't have that privilege, their religion is imperfect by all means. And our religion is perfect by all means. We have a preserved Quran that no one can change, no one can remove, no one can alter, no one can reconsider the content that it has, revise it, edit it, include, insert verses, remove verses. All these have happened to the Bible. Whether the Old Testament or the New Testament, so that encompasses the Jews and the Christians, the Torah and the Gospel. But the Qur'an is above and beyond. And secondly, this Qur'an cannot be understood, it cannot be implemented without the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And anyone who claims otherwise is on the verge of leaving Islam. Those funny individuals that call themselves Qur'anites, the Qur'aniyuna, we only believe in the Qur'an. Ask this joker, how does he pray? How does he pray if he prays? And if he prays like we pray, from which ayah of the Quran did he get that? <laughs> which surah in the Quran tells you begin with takbirat al-ihram, then you dua al-istiftah, then you put your right hand on your left on your chest, then you recite surah al-fatiha, then you recite the surah, then you say Allahu Akbar, you go to ruku'ah, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Sami Allahu Liman Hamida. Where is it in the Quran? Oh, 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 it's not there. Okay, interesting. And if we were to look at the religion from A to Z, you will find out that in reality, without the Sunnah, you can only implement 10% of the, of the Quran in real life. Quran is principles. The human execution came through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the Qur'an walking around. He embodied the Qur'an in his behavior, in his character, <coughs> in his manners, in the way he prayed, in the way he worshipped Allah. So we have the Qur'an and the Sunnah and they are perfect. Therefore, any occasion that arose back then, that could have been incorporated into the religion, yet it was not, then we can no longer add it to the religion at some later time and say this is good, it will get you closer to Allah. Or this is a minor issue, pay it no mind, it's okay. No such thing. <coughs> For example, they prayed in the jama'ah with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for years. 
Can you imagine in this entire life, we don't have a single evidence, not even one, that when the Prophet ﷺ completed the salah, he turned around and he raised his hands and he made dua and the people with him, all of them made dua with him and said, Ameen, 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 and then they wiped their faces. Not even one, not even one. Search Bukhari, Muslim, Nasa'i, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, any Sunan that you want. You want to fabricate narrations? Sure, sure. We have people that are specialized in fabrication. Anyone can invent anything and attribute it to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah protected this religion by having means of verification. Where did you get that from? Is this hadith sahih? Because anybody can say anything. It's not in the Quran, therefore someone can claim and attribute to the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. They never did this. Today, you tell this to the Muslims, extremist, radical. The religion is simple. Ya we're making dua to Allah, we're trying to get closer to Allah. MashaAllah alayh. The Messenger of Allah missed out on it and you got the revelation? Or he knew but he kept it to himself, left us with un, uh, you know, information, missing information, and you got your own access to revelation you're teaching us? You cannot make any one of these assertions against the Messenger of Allah. They didn't do it, don't do it. There isn't anything, this is the simplest equation I can think of in this life. They didn't do it, don't do it. And don't get funny saying they didn't drive cars, therefore we don't drive cars. Driving a car is not an act of worship. Don't try to bring the worldly life into this. They didn't wear specs, they didn't wear this, they didn't wear shoes. They, that's matters of the world. We're talking about ibadah. <coughs> Anything they didn't do in ibadah, my brother in faith, don't do. They didn't shake hands after salah, don't do it. They didn't make a dua in unison, don't do it. And the list goes on and on. But today, Allah Musta'an, people love, they love innovations. And who's, who's the one behind these innovations, pushing them forward? The shayateen of human and jinn. Because he fails with the believers. He knows eventually you will go to Jannah. How else is he going to misguide the, the masses of people? If sinfulness is difficult for him, which he strives for, the better thing for the shaitan is changing the religion. So that there's confusion. There's an Indian Muslim, Pakistani Muslim, uh, Indonesian Muslim, Filipino Muslim, Malaysian Muslim, Gulf Muslim, and each Muslim is in his own world. Has his own set of rules, and his own set of worship, and his own set of concepts, and it's like we're uh, the United Nations coming together trying to share concepts with each other. It would have been lovely if it was just culture that we spoke about. No, it's the religion itself that has been divided also based on our backgrounds and nationalities. That's insane. But today, that's the norm. And people embrace it. So why am I saying this? Because there's a second principle. And that second principle has also to do with the perfection of the religion. And it's the fact that we are supposed to be unique. Muslims are supposed to differentiate themselves from the non-Muslims in matters of religion as a fundamental principle. Again, in the matters of religion, we are supposed to be unlike the Jews and the Christians in everything. And that was something the Prophet wasallam strove for. To the point that the Jews picked up on it. And they said, this man is not going to leave any matter of ours except that he will go against it. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, pray with your shoes on. Because the Jews and the Christians don't pray with their shoes on. <coughs> don't get confused. I'm not telling you to enter the masjid that has rugs. But in an occasion where you are outdoor and you are able to pray with your shoes, it is the sunnah for you to keep your shoes on and pray with them rather than take them off. That is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It's abandoned today. Today they see the shoes, it's as if he saw shaitan. He will grab them, throw them away. Or if you put them in front of you, you say, Ya Shaykh, you're praying to the shoes. Come on, grow up. 
The religion was never like that. No one is praying to the shoes. And the shoes are tahir. They are pure by default. Our religion is not one of hallucination. Well, I went to the bathroom 45 minutes ago. There must have been some urine on the floor of the bathroom. Therefore, if I walk outside, there must be some urine left on my shoe. Somewhere in the soil between the cracks. And so if I... Yeah, Sheikh. That's not how the religion works. As soon as you walk out on a clean surface from the bathroom, your shoes are pure in Islam. Leave alone these hallucinations. If you want to be clean, Jazakallah khair. But don't make it a matter of najis and purity. Don't say you cannot pray in these shoes. The shoes, the plague people make sujood over here. That's you adding to the religion what the religion didn't give you. Our religion is simple in this manner. You pray with your shoes on. As an example, to differentiate yourself from the Jews. So what is it that I'm going to talk about? And what is this introduction for? We will find out inshallah ta'ala in the second part of the khutbah. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُ الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. As you know, my brothers and sisters in faith, we are a couple of days, or perhaps a day away from the first of Muharram, and the first of Muharram has a religious significance and a worldly significance, and I will explain both, إن شاء الله. But I will also highlight the issue that the people have attached to this particular day. First of all, Muharram is one of the Al-Ashur Al-Hurum, Al-Arba, the four sacred months that was prohibited for the believers to fight during those times. And so that month has a special virtue and, and sanctity in and of itself. As Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not oppress yourselves in these months. You're supposed to be in a better condition than the remaining eight months of the year. So it's a virtuous month and the Prophet ﷺ used to fast often in the month of Muharram. He used to fast often in the month of Muharram ﷺ. The worthy significance has to do with Umar ibn Khattab. During his reign as the Khalifa, he used to receive different letters from the people of the government back then and those letters would come with no dates they would send them with no dates and this created an issue because from a logistic point of view you need to know when this document was written and when it was authorized because all that is relevant to the progress of the ummah and the nation and therefore Omar gathered the sahaba and they discussed what could be appropriate for a, a year the beginning of a year because they did not want to emulate the Jews and the Christians and the Romans who each had their own time. They wanted something unique to the Muslims. So they thought among the opinions was the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ from Mecca to Medina which was the Rabi' al-Awwal. But that opinion didn't pass through. The majority of the Sahaba and the people back then opted for the option of Muharram be in the beginning of the year because of its sacredness and that it is more appropriate that the year begin from the first of Muharram for logistic purposes strictly there is no relationship between that and any type of celebration any type of worship any type of greetings and congratulations that the people have added today and therefore, they agreed on that, and that's where the subject matter should have ended. However, of course, the Muslims have to tweak things. Why keep them simple? No. <coughs> Let us observe what our fellow Jews and Christians are doing, and we will do it with an Islamic flavor. We'll just use different words, and we will use our own cultural ways, and khalas. Bottom line is, if they do it, we have to do it. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ informed us that that's how we are. He said, you will follow the Jews and the Christian an arm's length to an arm's length, and a hand span to a hand span. Even if they entered the hole of a lizard, you will enter it. 
If the Jews and the Christians saw a hole and they was listen, they enter, the Muslim will go right after them. We have to. <laughs> this is not to generalize. This is for the masses. Of course, there are always elite Muslims who are above and beyond. Ask Allah to make us among them. Who don't follow that. And therefore, they're not fooled by this hype. So brothers in faith, even though the first of Muharram can be tomorrow or the day after, there's absolutely nothing special about it. In a sense that you should not greet one another Happy New Year. كُلُّ عَامُ وَأَنْتُمْ بِخَيْرٍ Where did that come from? Oh, I'll tell you where it came from. I've, I've mixed with the Christians all my life. Lebanon is a half Muslim, half Christian country. These are pure Christian traditions. Maybe you don't have as many Christians in your own country, you don't know where it came from. This expression, كُلُّ عَامٌ وَأَنْتُمْ بِخَيْرٍ is a purely Christian invention. Every year, and you are in good condition. Basically, Happy New Year. May Allah make this new year blessed for you, my brother. Why now? Why this new year blessed? You want the rest of my life to be miserable? May Allah bless you and bless your life, ya akhi. Stop connecting this dua of yours <coughs> with a particular day. The third bid'ah, accountability. If you're, not, you're an accountant today. You have to go to your bedroom, pull out your uh, notebook and write all the sins you've done this past year. Inshallah, my new year resolution is that I will quit all of these and do tawbah. Ya Sheikh. Ya Sheikh. Tawbah is required after every sin. There is no such thing that you wait for a particular time of the year where you start thinking about your problems and then how you're going to solve them. That's an ongoing process every day of our lives. And we will continue to live like this until we meet Allah because we're all sinful. All of us are sinful. But the concept of choosing, selecting a particular day to help hold ourselves accountable before we are held accountable in al Qiyamah and choosing the beginning of the year because again, Christian methodology is New Year resolution. I know you've heard it sometime in your life. What's your New Year resolution? Oh, I'm going to lose weight. Two months later, he's 20 kilos heavier than before. People wait for a particular day to, now this new year, 2020 is going to be it. Sheikh, what 2020? What Baqdir? Stop counting 14, 40, 14, 41. All this is useless. These numbers are for documents and contracts and your salary to come in and go out. When you pay the bills and when you receive the salary. Khalas! We don't function in this manner. We don't connect our relationship with Allah based on a particular day or that. We have virtuous times. Ramadan, the 10th of the Hijjah, the day of Ashura. Sure. Alhamdulillah, whatever from the Sunnah, we accept and we submit and we don't negotiate. We even shut down our intellect if it's from the Prophet Because you don't have to understand it. With all due respect, even if you are Einstein, you don't have to understand it. Even if you value yourself as a very intellectual person, you still don't have to understand it. Some things are just faith. You submit. If Allah gave you His wisdom, then you would be some rival to Allah. Allah gave us very little. You've only been given of knowledge a little bit, all of us combined. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Not even a drop in the sea of Allah's knowledge. Humans want to interfere and, and debate with the Creator. No, this is too much, this is extreme in the religion, I don't think this is right. Yes, yeah, Shaykh. If Allah revealed it, if the Prophet وسلم, either we say, I am weak, I'm a sinful Muslim, may Allah guide me and give me submission, or I do it. There is no third option of interrogating and questioning the wisdom behind any ruling in Islam. We are not in this position. Never been, never will be. This is the sound way of dealing with things. So I advise myself and you, be a source of light in your community. Share this message with the people that you know. If you receive greetings, don't be rude. Of course, there's a fine line between being rude and between trying to educate. Don't be rude to the person, he doesn't know any better. We can't blame also what's happening because this is what's around us. A lot of us are simply innocent. This is the information that was communicated, we don't know any better.
Alhamdulillah, if we learn, let us educate those other people. Ya akhi, such and such, there is no special occasion. May Allah bless you for the dua. Wallahi, it's nice of you that you thought of me. However, there is no special occasion for this, for you to make this dua. If he accepts the advice, Alhamdulillah, if he doesn't, Jazakallah khair. You've done your part of creating awareness in the community. And Allah guides whomever he wills. Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub thabit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarif al qulub isrif qulubana ala ta'atik. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم ات نفوسنا تقواها وزكها انت خير من زكاها انت وليها ومولاها وانت على كل شيء قدير اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الاحياء منهم والاموات uh, brothers, just a quick reminder, may Allah bless you, regarding uh, Khutbah al-Jum'ah. Uh, we've mentioned this before, but in case there are no faces, any kind of movement during the Khutbah will take away from the reward of your Khutbah. A movement that is unnecessary. So the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ مَسَّ الْحَصَى فَقَدْ لَغَى وَمَنْ لَغَى فَلَا جُمْعَةَ لَهَ Back then they used to have pebbles instead of rugs. Pebbles, small rocks. So the person while sitting, he would be busying himself with the pebbles. And whoever plays with those pebbles has no Jum'ah. He doesn't have to pray for Rak'ah because he will pray with the Imam, but the reward of listening to the khutbah is gone. <coughs> Similarly, drinking water during the khutbah, or engaging in a conversation, or giving salam and returning salam, all of these are not to be done during the khutbah. The only exception to this rule is if, if somebody makes noise, you can gesture, not verbally speak, gesture for them to calm down. Or if someone enters late, they're supposed to pray before they sit down. They are supposed to pray before they sit down. Because that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. He made the person get up and pray. And as soon as they're done, they're supposed to listen to the khutbah attentively. So it's, I know it's maybe 25 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is. You can scratch if you have to scratch. Other than that, it's really a short span of time, discipline. For you to focus, don't busy yourself with your toes, with your fingers, with your clothes, with whatever it is, and get the reward of Jum'ah, and then go home and do whatever makes you happy. But it's about discipline, and we have to teach our children the same thing. Sometimes the children come and he's drinking and playing with the bottles, you know, making all types of noises. It, it, it distracts everybody, the speaker and the audience. So this is just among the etiquettes of Jum'ah. Ask Allah to make us among those who listen to the reminder and follow the best of his.